Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I remind you that he loves to hear from us. Let's pray. Uh, Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we just sang, Who am I? Uh, What is man, uh, what is woman, that you are mindful of each and every one of us? Uh, Who are we, Lord, uh, that you would be mindful, that you would look beyond our sin uh, with your great, great love, that you would look beyond our sin and desire uh, to redeem us? And we bless you. Uh, for so great a Savior, for so great uh, the person that you are, uh, so great a gospel, uh, that we might be called the sons and daughters of the living God, that we might be called children of God. And Father, I think of what that scripture says, that it uh, it's, uh, hasn't been revealed what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall be as he is, and we shall be like him. And we... Lord, we just bless you for that. And we thank you that we have a hope. And we thank you that we have a future laid up for us in heaven. And we thank you, Lord, that we can't buy it with billions of dollars. Uh, We can't uh, buy it with good works. We can't say, "Look uh, look, look at me, look at what I've done. Uh, It's by the work of God at Calvary and by the work of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know, Lord, that we will be like you someday. Uh, We thank you for your great love, your perseverance. Uh, We thank you that when we fall seven times, you pick us up seven times. Uh, Even 70 times seven, you pick us up. We thank you that you're the hound of heaven, that you never quit on us, you never let go. Uh, We thank you, Lord, that you just are so persevering and uh, so patient and so loving kind with each and every one of us. Uh, We thank you, Lord, that you don't use a cookie-cutter approach with each of us. Uh, As individuals, you meet us right where we're at, and you work uh, with us despite our shortcomings and our failures and and all of our little idiosyncrasies and and how we are as, as sinful beings, and yet redeemed beings. And so uh, we, we thank you for uh, your great love and your great grace and your great mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you intercede for us daily. And we thank you that we can intercede for uh, others as well. We lift up Harold, Lord, uh, touch his knee, uh, give him more mobility that he can be with us next week. Uh, Father, I think of Sandy Sherman, um, I thank you for the report this past week that she's doing so much better, that she's so much stronger. And, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, her faith and uh, her love for you. And we thank you for this answered prayer. Uh, Father, I lift up uh, Patricia Fogel, uh, that you would strengthen her with her heart condition. We think of uh, Fred these days. Uh, encourage him. Also, Father, too, uh, for those who are unable to make it here today, uh, that you would encourage them and bless their hearts. Uh, Lord, also for, uh, for the many things that are on our hearts today, um, and I don't even begin to know uh, the half of it of what's on the hearts of your people, but uh, we, uh, we know that you do, and uh, we pray that you would give uh, peace and resolve and understanding and patience to wait upon you to deal with uh, these concerns or any anxieties or any burdens or trials that uh, these people are going through. And also, Lord, too, I pray that you would keep Jerry uh, alert as she drives home today, and thank you uh, for the time that she had with her loved ones. Uh, We want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, we have our first scripture reading. Bill? Our first reading this morning is from the sixth chapter of the book of Daniel, verses 1 through 15. It's found on page 862 of the church Bible. <clears throat> it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, 
to the three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. <clears> the <throat> royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men, <coughs> excuse me, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. This is the word of our Lord. Continuing on, the sixth chapter of Daniel, I'll be reading verses 16 through the end of the chapter, and again, on, starting on page 862 in the Red Church Bible. So... The king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of the nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. 
My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. May the Lord add his blessing. What a great account of scripture. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we give you this time, open the eyes of our hearts, so we pray that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So folks, this morning uh, we're going to look at the account of Daniel winding up in the lion's den. Now I'm going to make some observations about this, but I'm going to ask the question this morning, are you a Daniel? Now before I do so, uh, ladies, if you want to say, uh, am I a Danielle? Eh, it's pushing the envelope a little bit, but we'll take it, all right? But are you a Daniel? Now, before I um, get to the text, I would like to read a section from a book. Uh, it's called 100 Bible Verses That Made America. It's by Robert Morgan. This account occurred on October 26, 1788. The section is entitled, Kindling the Great Awakening, and it's based on 1 Kings uh, chapter 10, verse 7, which reads, quote, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told me. So let me read this account. Quote, this is by Robert Morgan, Evangelical Christianity crashed after the American Revolution. Church attendance dropped to near nothing, and French rationalism swept over colleges, which became hotbeds of atheism. Thomas Paine's anti-Christian ravings demoralized the church, and the reorganization of society and its westward, westward expansion left little time for spirituality. Chief Justice John Marshall worried that the church was too far gone to be redeemed. But a second great awakening was on its way, kindled by students at Virginia's Hampton Sydney College. The first great awakening, remember, had stirred the American colonies with spiritual vitality and zeal. Now America needed a second dose. A Sydney, Sydney Hampton, a Ham, I'm sorry, a Hampton Sydney student named Carrie Allen had embraced Christ in September 1787. Another, William Hill, began secretly reading Joseph Aline's book, Alarmed to the Unconverted, which he kept locked in his trunk. One day, a third student, James Blythe, found him reading it and broke out in sobs under deep conviction. 
These three students met secretly for prayer in a thick forest about a mile from the college and determined to meet the next Sunday on campus. Their secrecy was due to other students' animosity toward Christians. Fundamentalist secularism, which is what we're dealing with today, harbors a deep intolerance for the Christian faith. That was as true in the early 1800s as it is today. As Hill later recounted, although we hung and prayed, although we sung and prayed with suppressed voices, not wishing it should be known that what we were about, we were overheard by some of the students when it was noised about through every room in the college. And a noisy mob was raised which collected in the passage before our door and began to thump at the door and whoop and swear and threaten vengeance. We had to cease and bear the ridicule and abuse of this noisy riot, which could not be quiet, quiet, quieted until two of the professors intervened and honored them all to their rooms. Information of this riot was given to the president, Robert Blair Smith, who demanded the cause of the riot and who were the leaders in it. Some of the most prominent leaders stepped forward and said um, uh, there were some students who had shut themselves up in one of the rooms in the college and began singing and praying and carrying on like Methodists. And they were determined to break it up. The president's eyes filled with tears. After a short pause, he said, and has it come to this? Is it possible some of my students are under religious impressions and determined to serve their savior? And is it possible that there are such monsters of iniquity in college who dare set themselves against such things? Turning to the Christians, Smith said, I rejoice, my young friends, that you have taken the stand that you have. You shall not be interrupted in your meetings for the future. Your appointment next Saturday afternoon shall be held in my parlor, and I will be with you. It goes, he goes on to write, A sense of conviction swept over the college, and the next week the parlor was filled with praying students. A spirit of revival overspread the campus and penetrated into Virginia, spreading through the churches and the schools. President Blair's father, who had been converted during the First Great Awakening, came to investigate the matter. On October 26, 1788, he wrote to a friend, the half was not told me of the display of God's power and grace among them. No, not the tenth part. I have seen nothing equal to it for extensive spread power and spiritual glory since the years of 40 and 41. The word has spread for hundreds of miles. The blessed work has spread among many people of every description, high and low, rich and poor, learned and unlearned, orthodox and heterodox, sober and rude, white and black, young and old, especially the youth. The elder Blair was using biblical language when he said the half had not been told him. That was the reaction of the Queen of Sheba when she visited the kingdom of Israel in Solomon's time and saw the great wealth, education, public works, and unity of the land. She, she said she didn't believe the earlier reports she had heard until she came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told me. Morgan goes on to write, that's how observers described the revival that erupted on university campuses at the beginning of the period known as the Second Great Awakening, the series of revivals that swept over the new United States of America, starting among students at places like Hamden, Sydney College. One of the marvels of American history is how the country was born between two of the greatest revivals in history. The First Great Awakening prepared the colonies for independence, and the second solidified her moral and spiritual foundation for the future. Today, our nation's problems are not primarily political, but spiritual. And the answers are not found in our politics, 
but in this, the hope of another spiritual return to God. Unquote. You know, we read about the revolution, you know, when we read about the founders and how God was in it, and we get this sense that America was always on fire, not necessarily, spiritually, not necessarily. To give you a sense of the spiritual decline after the Revolutionary War, it was the year 1787, the first Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love, my, my roots, right? You should get there someday, very historical like Boston. But in the very first meeting was in disarray. They couldn't agree on anything except George Washington being the chair of the meeting. So after a raucous meeting or after a bunch of uh, um, um, disunity and squibbles and quabbles and whatnot, Ben Franklin gets up, the elder statesman that he was, and he appealed to open the meetings in prayer. And he went to say, you know, we prayed, you know, during the Revolutionary War. We prayed before this battle, and we prayed for this situation, and before that. Why don't we open in prayer? They forgot about prayer. After they started to pray at every meeting, they started to agree. Isn't that funny? And they started to give formation and shape to the Constitution that governs our great nation. I share these illustrations, folks, this morning because they are a fitting reminder for our time. Nothing happens apart from prayer. Amen? It doesn't. Be it in our church or in our society, be it in our own lives or in the lives of others, prayer is the means for spiritual revival, not politics. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't get politically involved. I believe that you need to. But prayer is the means for spiritual revival, and Lord knows our churches need it, our church needs it, our churches need it, our communities need it, our society needs it. And God has to be the one to save our country. He's the one who delivers. And as I look at the passage in Daniel, it's a fitting reminder when Daniel goes into the lion's den. He's got to deliver. He's got to answer the prayer or all hope is lost. And we forget about prayer, don't we? Like the founding fathers, we forget and we seek to do it in our own strength. We forget to ask God for unity and to open doors. The Apostle Paul was asking early on the, for the church to pray for an open door for the gospel. And we forget about the power that comes through prayer. We forget about how prayer changes hearts and lives and situations. And we forget about how it changes societies. Now, chapter 6 opens here uh, with a change in leadership. Uh, chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall, the Babylonians are out, the Persians are in, and there's a mob seeking the head of Daniel. And he, uh, the officers are plotting, to, uh, other officials are plotting to take him down. And Daniel knew the score. After they passed the edict, or got the king to pass the edict, Daniel went into his room. He knew that there was a setup. He knew what was happening. He saw it coming. He knew that they were going to hurt and censor him. Lots of deceit and underhanded policies that sought to put Daniel between the rock and the hard place or the king's edict and the lion's den. And you know, as looking at this here, it actually, it really wasn't those deceitful policies that put Daniel in the lion's den, now was it? It was that he openly refused, he openly refused to stop worshiping and stop praying in public. That's what put him in the lion's den. He says, I'm not going to cave in. I'm not doing it. His faith was a badge of honor. As he, as he took a stand, let's not forget that he took a knee. He prayed. 
He refused to compromise. He refused to compromise on prayer, on worship, his beliefs. He wasn't going to be bullied, silenced, or censored. That's Daniel. I, I asked you a relevant question this morning. Are you a Daniel? That's a great question, especially for our time. Are you a Daniel? Do you refuse to compromise? Do you refuse to... Ba to <laughs> are you going to hold fast to prayer and worship publicly and your beliefs? Do you refuse to be bullied and censored or silenced? You know, today, you know, you speak truth, you get bullied and censored. You stand up for Christ, you get mocked or ostracized or even persecuted. Jesus said it, didn't he? You know, he said it was going to happen. Well, we've just been so cozy in our country and our society, right? We've had it pretty good for a real long time. <laughs> you go to Pakistan, you go to India, you go to Sri Lanka, you go to Muslim countries, <laughs> you go to Egypt. They, they haven't had it easy for a very, very long. They know the score. Uh, we are living in a day and age where there's a great opportunity to let your light shine before men. You know, you start to see the cream separate from the rest, right? The cream rise to the top. That was Daniel. Yeah, I was listening to a video the other day, or um, kind of a, somewhat of a message, but maybe a seminar, but someone said that there's three kinds of churches and believers. Those that are apathetic, scared, and disengaged from the political and cultural war. They want nothing to do with it. Those that have joined, the other ones are those that have joined the other side and have become instruments of left-wing activism and have bowed the knee to bail. And then the third are, is those that are willing to stake a stand those that refuse to be intimidated. You know, it was Daniel choosing God that put him in the lion's den. Nothing short of that. He chose to do the right thing. That's what got him in trouble. Letting his light before, shine before men, that's why he was a target. You know, Daniel was a mover and a shaker in his time. Uh, we see the kind of believer that Daniel was. If you go back to chapter 1, he sought out um, the administrator over him and argued and lobbied, if you will, for dietary laws so they wouldn't violate the law of their God. He prayed about that and he sought favor. You see that same thing that Nehemiah did, right? He prayed about it and he asked for favor before the king. He put God to the test. And the, you know, the Hebrews fared way better than all the others. They looked better than chapter 1. Chapter 2, he starts a prayer vigil trusting God for... Listen to this. Not the, just interpretation of the dream. He, he needed to know the dream. He needed to know the dream. That's, that's incredible focus of prayer. Talk about a prayer vigil. That was an all-nighter, folks. So he and his friends wouldn't be put to death. He needed to know the dream and its interpretation. I take a look at Daniel chapter 3. I think Daniel was a great example to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think he taught them well. I think they learned from him. Are you a Daniel? Do you teach your friends well? Daniel was not caving the godless policies of the day. He knew that the kingdom of God would be the only kingdom standing. Read the end of the dream, right? Uh, in chapter 2. That was the interpretation. The kingdom of God comes down from heaven and smashes all the other kingdoms of the world. He wasn't caving. Uh, how, how do you measure up when standing up for what is right and lovely and true and of a good report? 
I love that passage in Philippians. Whatever is true and whatever is lovely. I believe he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Focusing on Christ. Are you, are you standing up for Jesus? Or are you, are you bending the knee to God? Or to Baal? Are you willing to compromise for 30 pieces of silver? Are you willing to sell out because your life may be on the line? I'm telling you, you got a separation of the wheat and the chaff these days. You can see it. I ask you these questions, folks, because my job, I don't care if I have six, sixty, six hundred, six thousand. I ask the question because it's my job to feed the sheep. It's my job to speak truth to your hearts that God would prick the conscience. And it's tough, soul-searching questions. Because I know, I know when, when the stuff hits the fan, the rubber meets the road, there are people that are bailing. There are people that are bailing because they're not strong enough to stay in the fight. I'm telling you, I know it. Are, are you spiritually ready for trying times? We're here. We're in it. We're living in a day and age where we need to take a stand and yet take the knee, like Daniel did. Engage and not disengage. So I, I ask you, what do you think Daniel did in that lion's den? Here, kitty, kitty. We got these two little kittens, right? We, we rescued from the... I told you this, right? We rescued them from the barn. And uh, so I find myself saying lately, Hey, kitty, kitty. Or what was that, what was that cartoon? What was that cartoon uh, character that said, I thought I'd throw a putty cat. <laughs> I do that. I walk around the house. I say, I think I saw two putty cats. <laughs> do you think he played with the big cats? Or do you think he took a knee? I think he took a knee. I know what I'm doing. In the lion's den, I'm taking the knee. I'm praying, praying, praying. Who knows? Maybe, maybe I doze off like Peter, James, and John, right? In the garden? That's okay. <laughs> you know, with the cats, if you don't move, they ignore you. Maybe Daniel fell asleep. Who knows? Maybe he slept like a baby. Maybe he slept better than the king. Uh, Daniel prayed three times a day. We're told to pray without ceasing. We're told to come in faith believing. We're told to pray, to pray and, and our faith can move mountains. And we're told in Hebrews 11 that prayer and faith shut the mouths of lions. And so we read that God sends his angel to help. It's all God, but God. It's all but God, right? And so the picture here is Daniel trusted, he prayed, he did not fear the decrees of men, he feared God. Jesus said, do not fear them who can hurt your body, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So are you a Daniel? I ask you, are you a Daniel? Because I guarantee you, at some point, you'll be in the lion's den. Maybe it's before a group of people who want to crush her bones, rip her heads off. Maybe it's before a raucous group like the unbelievers uh, that stood outside the dorm of those college kids in 1788. Maybe it's like the mobs that stormed our cities this past summer. Maybe it's before a magistrate like the Apostle Paul. Because, you know, you're standing before the judge because you stood for Christ. That day's coming, folks. It's already here. So what's, what's the takeaway? Daniel gives us a blueprint for prayer, faith, trust, great confidence, great commitment before God, great courage in the face of danger. And you know, all these qualities, they're a result. They come from prayer, but it comes from a relationship with God. That's what it comes from. Solomon says the righteous are as bold as a lion. They're courageous. Courageous, righteous people don't back down. They take their stand. They refuse to be intimidated. 
because they live and they take their stand in Christ. You know what's often forgotten, uh, and I do this too, but you know, we go right to the lion's den, don't we? You know, because uh, that's kind of like the, it's almost like the climax of the story. What's often forgotten is Daniel's character. Take a look at verse 3. Daniel distinguished himself. Uh, literally, it means to show leadership and ability. Are you leading by example? Verse 3, Daniel, the scripture says, had an extraordinary spirit. Uh, here are some of the synonyms. Excellent, special, outstanding, exceeding, superiority, very or extremely, surpassing, exceeding. That's the kind of character and spirit that Daniel had. By the way, this is the same word that was used in chapter 2 of the huge golden statue that um, uh, was um, the image uh, of that statue. And so, the, in other words, Daniel was a very, very special person. And he let his light shine before men. Are you a Daniel? Uh, you also read the account here, uh, the king's disposition tells us what he thought of Daniel, right? He was distressed. Over the, he, he was troubled, he didn't sleep all night. He knew that he was deceived and duped. Uh, you know, it's funny, why, why pass a law for 30 days like this? Did you notice that? They just passed it for 30 days. Uh, this king, a uh, very special king, uh, he was confident that God would help Daniel. And, and so I want you to ponder... Um, the effect of Daniel's character, his leadership ability, the kind of person he was in terms of influencing the king and other people around him. Before I close this morning, I want you to consider how one saint who took a stand, he also took a knee, consider how Daniel changed society. First of all, he made a lasting impression on the king, made a lasting impression on, impression on the governance of that nation, and Daniel made a lasting impression on changing the course of history. Let me, let me redirect you to verses 25 through 28 again. I want to rewrite, they're worth rereading. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men. Every, of every language who were living in all the land. May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, again, all by God's help, right? But this is, this is a takeaway. Never, ever, ever underestimate how God may use you. How he may answer your prayers. We need, we need a spiritual awakening. The churches do. Our country does. The church needs Daniels today. Amen? Are you a Daniel? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, bless you for the scripture, and we pray uh, that we would be like Daniel. Uh, we pray that we would be willing to be like Daniel and to sacrifice all, uh, to speak truth, to stand for Christ, to take the knee during these real hard times, 
And Lord, uh, we greatly, greatly need you to revive our church, our community, our churches, our society, our country from top to bottom, Lord. We need you to do it. Uh, We ask and pray uh, that you would be pleased uh, uh, to start here uh, or to start somewhere, Lord. We, uh, we, We don't care where you start, but we pray that you would start somewhere. Uh, We thank you for this scripture. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.